Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a great guest that you're really going to enjoy. So we talk a lot about a type of political theory on this channel called neo-reactionary theory. And the godfather of that type of political theory is, of course, Curtis Yarvin, originally writing under his name, Mencius Moldbug, his pen name there. And he's great at breaking down a lot of systems, but many people have noticed a problem. They said, does this guy have any solutions? Does he ever actually offer any way out? Is there any way forward with this stuff? Well, I want to go over a concept that I have hinted at many times, but I've never actually done a complete video or stream on called neocameralism. This is the concept that Curtis Yarvin brought up as his solution to the problem of governance. So joining me with me today to do that is the Prudentialist. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me on again, Oren. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. So we're going to be digging into this idea of neocameralism. What is the solution? What's it about? What are its principles? And do they hold up? I mean, this was written well over a decade ago. Does this still apply? Is there still a way forward with this? We'll dig into all that. But before we do, guys, let's hear from our sponsors today. Are you a college student who feels isolated as Cthulhu swims ever leftward? The Intercollegiate Studies Institute is here to help. ISI offers programs and opportunities for conservative students across the country. ISI understands that conservatives and right-of-center students feel isolated on campus and that you're often fighting for your own reputation, dignity, and future. Through ISI, you can learn about what Russell Kirk called permanent things, the philosophical and political teachings that shaped and made Western civilization great. ISI also offers many opportunities to jumpstart your career. For example, Nate Hockman, who's been a guest on this show multiple times, got his start at National Review through ISI, and he's just one of many journalists that ISI has helped start their career. If you're a graduate student, ISI offers funding opportunities to sponsor the next generation of college professors. But most importantly, ISI offers college students a community of people that will help them grow. If you're a college student, ISI can help you start a student organization or a student newspaper or meet other like-minded students at various conferences and events. ISI is here to educate the next generation of great Americans. To learn more, check out ISI.org. That's ISI.org. You can click the link down in the description to learn more. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and jump into this. So like I said, we're going to be exploring Curtis Yarvin's idea of neocameralism today. Uh, many people have pointed out that Curtis Yarvin is an excellent systems analyst. He's very good at explaining why things happen at uh, diagramming how power flows and how our political system works. But many people have been critical of his solutions. And we want to jump into those solutions today and kind of take a look at them and say, how do these work? Where do they come from? What do they mean? Are they still applicable? Is there a way to salvage these kind of things? We're going to jump into that today. So the first thing I want to touch on is kind of the roots of neocameralism. A lot of people might be aware, but some people may not, that Curtis Yarvin and many other neo-reactionary thinkers tend to come from the libertarian sphere. They were originally people who were libertarians, and when they approach things, they do kind of have that mindset. They've moved beyond libertarianism. They still don't, uh, you know, they, they don't really follow all of its tenets, but there's still that DNA inside of these ideas. Now, neocameralism is going to specifically come as, as a very uh, uh, libertarian influenced idea because it's going to talk about, uh, believe it or not, corporate ownership of countries, how companies, how countries can be run by corporations. And this ties, uh, this ties Curtis Yarvin to many other libertarian style thinkers, people like Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, who, who kind of outlined the ways in which kind of these societies might run uh, Prudential is just kind of the outset. What do you think about the libertarian origins of this thought? D does it make sense the transition between libertarianism and the kind of uh, the kind of I guess you know futuristic neo feudalism he's going to talk about here? Well, yeah, I, I think that you can definitely see the Hans Hermann Hoppe influence on sort of this neo cameralist uh, idea that Yarvin puts out. You see it, especially when you think of like Hans Hermann Hoppe's works about, you know, from aristocracy to monarchy to democracy, that, you know, things were more productive in the sort of era of uh, some sort of medieval feudalism where there was less likelihood to have more freedom or people could be not under the control of some leviathan state. Uh, you kind of see this being reinvented in a way or repackaged with sort of that 
Silicon Valley, you know, influence that Yarvin clearly has both as a systems analyst, but also as someone who sort of looks at things like a startup state. And it, it shows where he starts talking about this sort of neo-feudal concept where we want to have a world where the sort of micro states can better organize themselves and are focused on profit motive rather than sort of the uh, traditional idea of a, of a state ruling overall and having this concept of a nation state. It returns to something smaller. Yeah, I think there's a big focus on the competition, right? The, the competitive aspect. So, for instance, you know, he talks about in his, his essay, Patchwork, about how the different uh, warring states, so, you know, kind of the political disunion of smaller city states in places like Greece or Italy created these, you know, Renaissance type environments or these uh, antiquity environments that were just kind of these cultural, political, philosophical and scientific uh, hotbeds uh, because the constant uh, kind of rubbing and 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 uh, competition of these small independent uh, you know nation states allowed kind of the emergence of these uh, superior cultures uh, these big booms and leaps forward in kind of human civilization and the the idea here is kind of similar right rather than having these large Leviathan style nations rather than having you know giant empires of the united states or china or or any of these other nations the idea is instead to break things down he calls in you know neocameralism he also calls this a system of patchwork right these different countries form a patchwork of of different societies and in each one of these patches you would have basically kind of a corporate ceo uh running the patch being being the executive the the kind of uh, neo monarch of that patch, and that would be run for kind of the profitability of uh, the you know the kind of the joint stockholders, those who have an investment in the patch in the small nation state. And the purpose here is really for Yarvin, I think, the em elimination of democracy. Right? He sees democracy as this uh, inhibition to human development. He sees this as a big hindrance uh, to kind of creating a productive society, much again like Hans Hermann Hoppe did, and that by removing this trend towards democracy and kind of allowing these visionary leaders, these CEOs, to drive things along kind of one line, you create these, these you know, tiny city-states that would be very effective they wouldn't have to worry about the constant, you know, uh, democratic uh, churn, the bureaucratic grind, and they would be able to do great things, uh, you know, individually. Yeah, no, I, that seems to be a pretty good uh, outline for what we're trying to describe here. And to me, it really does illustrate that he wants to combine, and he talks about this, the, the neo-cameralist form of government that he wants, these sort of uh, corporate or sovereign corporate entities with sort of a CEO monarchy. He's talking about this as early as 2007, 2008. Uh, you can sort of see the evolution of his thought even now into Gray Mirror, uh, that he looks at these you know, smaller Italian states pre-unification, both during the medieval period and as well as into the uh, late 19th uh, century, as well as sort of what, you know, was classically called the Concert of Europe between 1815 to 1914. These sort of smaller states, like a German confederation, you see the reference to Frederick the Great quite often here yeah. uh, in his work. So that's sort of the framework that he wants to apply with a 21st century um, cryptographic form of command and control where you are obviously signing on to you know uh user license agreement stuff to to sign on and live in these little territories and if you don't like it you can go somewhere else because there might be a place that is more fitting to your specific kind of needs as a consumer not just someone like a citizen that we have now where we have limited uh sway on our governments because of democracy and bureaucracy and instead you'd have the opportunity to just uh say well this isn't working out these guys for and they're willing to take me so see ya. yeah and that's a really key difference here that you just brought up right in america we think of you know voice as the big thing right we have a voice we have a say in government we have an input uh, into how things are going to be run and if we can collectively gather our voices together we can change the direction of government now obviously we know there's a lot of problems with that model if you need 
uh, to check in on the problem of, with that model. I did a, a, a stream with last things on kind of Nick Land's problem with democracy, kind of laying out why that doesn't necessarily work the way that many people think it does. But either way, that is kind of the American solution. And many the solution for many nations is the idea of voice. But instead of voice, Yarvin focuses on exit, right? The idea is all exit, no voice. So the country is going to run the way it's going to run because the CEO is running it in the interests of the shareholders. That So that is going to be the overriding kind of uh, you know single vision of how this is going to run. You are not going to have a voice in this. You do not have a democratic process. There is no voting. There is no input for you. However, what you do have is the opportunity to exit at any time. No one is stopping you from leaving one patch and going to the other. And the hope is that because each patch is relatively small, it's not a large empire, you could easily you know, move from one to another. And because they'll be in constant competition for each other, they'll want good human capital, right? You'll, as a, as a, as a CEO running a patch, you're going to want the best, the brightest, the most productive. And so you're going to want to create a society that caters to those people. And so if anyone can leave your patch and go to another patch at any time, then that means you have to create an environment that attracts people who are going to be you know, uh, helping with your patch. And so the idea is like this constant ability to exit and this constant uh, option of, of competition creates almost the most free market possible for kind of how people would uh, align themselves in any given nation state. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the concept, of course, is that this is sort of a global system. Um, and because you have this strict market oriented competition, you want to ensure that you're a profitable entity that you can uh, have people, you know, being the productive consumer base and patron base for your sort of uh, startup business esque society, and that that's one way to maintain uh, sort of this mutual competition between states, and that having some kind of cryptographic control. And he's talking about this in two thousand eight. But, you know, that idea has sort of evolved now with the blockchain and crypto that you could have the ability to control how government works in a way that not one person can just usurp it and take over outside of the one that's deemed to be sovereign alongside the uh, likelihood of decreasing war. And he goes throughout this both as uh, neocameralism as an escalator of massarchy and then, of course, the four chapters on patchwork, his sort of idea for a world peace. But you know, he, he doesn't tell you how we would transition towards this, but it is sort of this theorized proposal for an alternative to the sort of democratic bureaucracy that we live under now. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are going to look at this as very pie in the sky, and they're going to be right about that. I don't think that this is a realistic solution kind of to where we're at now, but I do think it's an interesting and important thought experiment because it lets us look at kind of the limits of some of this type of thinking, right? Like he's going to take many of these libertarian solutions to their absolute maximum. And then we can kind of look at that and say, what parts of this work? What part of this parts are legitimate? What parts kind of fail, right? And, and where can we find a kind of different ways forward? So one thing that you talked about here was kind of the technological aspect of this solution, right? Uh, he talks about kind of this cryptographic government and, and that's been updated with kind of how uh, we, that he's because uh, it's been decades basically since he wrote this. And now in Gray Mirror, he's kind of fleshed this out in a more serious or I shouldn't say more serious. It's still a little fantasyful, but in, in a in a way that's more updated with our current technology, understanding that uh, basically you could set up a scenario where uh, kind of each one of these people is hidden but accountable um it, it could take a little longer we'd have to like read a whole essay to really get into this but but basically the idea is like each of the shareholders could be anonymous but but could be held accountable through the technology technology available that they could be tied to things like weapons control uh you know that that these things could be turned over to the ceo or denied to the ceo much in the way that a lot of people kind of want to use smart guns right where you have to use the fingerprint and you know, you have to biometrically affirm that you're the one who's allowed to, to operate this thing. You would tie these things, same things to the to the monarch, the CEO, 
that kind of stuff. And so that you could kind of uh, still create basically this, this uh, kind of accountability through the, uh, the corporate structure process and through the technological advancements that wouldn't be there than, you know, necessarily through just kind of the democratic process. Yeah, and this is where he calls this crypto governance or something along those lines. You want things to be anonymized to ensure that, and he also talks about this in Gray Mirror as well, that at any point in time, these you wouldn't know who the other key holders are as to ensure that you're not being influenced by other people in some, some form of conspiracy or in sort of an ideologically consistent way to govern because you never know if they might vote against you or may vote you out based upon your own record. Um, and he's, you know, he argues that this is a way to also link it to the military to ensure that you need uh, your patrons and subscribers to, to back this up in a way that if you wanted to declare war, uh, it'd have to be seen as like a viable way to do so, uh, and so on and so forth, alongside um, other decisions that may be made to be more competitive against your other sort of sovereign corporative entities, whether, you know, it, he prescribes the idea that like San Francisco at the time that had like 750,000 people living in it, right? Like they would spend millions of dollars beautifying the place, making sure that, you know, it was a good place to have a uh, business set up. That way you're making sure that they're not being taxed to death for maximum Laffer curve extraction and to be sort of the ideal world that you want to live in. Very sort of utopian minded, but in a way that seems, at least in his view, technologically feasible based upon the, the libertarian thinking that he had ranging from Hans Hermann Hoppe, mix it with a little bit of Sir Robert Filmer's Divine Right of Kings. And this yeah. is where he sort of sees the conclusion. Yeah, you can definitely see Hoppe's influence here. You know, uh, in Democracy, the God that Failed, Hoppe kind of lays out this idea of kind of these contractual communities and a big uh, part of this for Hoppe is, you know, a lot of people, when they think about libertarians, they think about just live and let live libertarians, right? Like whatever you want to do is fine. Uh, the, the government doesn't get involved in those kind of things. That's not actually kind of how Hoppe sees his construction of this. You have to abide, you know, by very strict uh, contracts moving into this. Uh, Hoppe is is very supportive of kind of the right of association and the right to, to say no to certain people, to demand certain things of people. Uh, he's very big on uh, kind of drawing those lines and allowing the community to kind of put those restrictions on itself. And really, Yarvin takes that a step further, right? He, he instead of saying the community will bind all of this stuff into kind of a agreed upon social contract, he says, I'm going to go a step further and I'm just going to kind of basically create a monarch who will have wide, you know, wide power, will have a you know, large amount of power to, uh, you know, he's not libertarian in this sense. The government will be able to take big moves, you know, have, have uh, wide sweeping powers. However, it will still be bound through this kind of corporate structure of accountability uh, backed up by that technological safeguard. And again, really essentially, there's this entrance and exit restriction you know there, there's there's a restriction on entrance but there's no restriction on exit you can leave whenever you want so you might have to meet some very serious requirements if you're running like the ideal patch you don't just want anyone in there like free immigration into your patch is a problem because if you're constructing this really profitable patch and then a bunch of people are like hey that's a really nice place to live i'm just going to move in there and not care about like what makes it profitable well they're just going to destroy your patch so you do have to have a lot of gatekeeping about who can move into your patch, but anyone can move out at any time to kind of move on to the next one where, where they think they'll they'll do better. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, we, we've been using the words exit and voice as alongside these entities, and I think it's important that we you know cite where he's getting this from. He's getting this from the uh, German political economist and philosopher Alberto Hirschman, uh, mm. who had wrote a, a book, I think, in the 1970s called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, and that exit in voice are ways to measure the decline of businesses and organizations. And that we see this particularly within democratic governments that, you know, the more vocal and the worse that things tend to get, um, this is a way to measure decline. Um, exit can also be seen as this, that people are leaving an organization either as consumers or shareholders. It is a sign that things are not going particularly well for you. Um, and in this instance, they want those things to happen. But if you want to have exit, you need to appreciate it and approve it in a way that 
they're not leaving because your company sucks, but that opportunity is available to them. You want low exit um, and low voice in respects to being an effective sort of business that people would want to invest in and live in and enjoy it. Uh, and to, to sort of date this, he compares it as to like how certain organizations have license agreements inside the, the video game Second Life. But uh, this thought kind of just echoes that there is sort of this philosophical tradition that goes back through the centuries that he's pulling all these different threads from to illustrate that this would be his model for how things work. So would would like Singapore be the closest thing we have to like a, a, a model for this kind of government that we see today? It would probably be the closest thing. And I mean, he references throughout his uh, works, uh, Singapore as an example, alongside its leadership. And um, to me, it seems like the closest thing that we might have. I mean, if if you could turn the the confederated states of micronesia into every little state being singapore every single little island then maybe that'd be the closest thing that we have but uh there is not a sort of in real world one-to-one -one example but that is the closest thing to work off of yeah so i guess we can kind of use that as as maybe a little jumping off point so i think we're going to get to plenty of problems but let's let's start with maybe some of the possible upsides right like what, what could be some of the advantages of this framework so the first thing obviously the thing he's most focused on and some people might you know find this controversial depending on how they feel about it but it eliminates democracy right um and by eliminating democracy it eliminates a lot of the social incentives for division right you you remove a lot of the the, because power is unified into one entity and the entity is without question because there is low voice, that means there is clear and decisive leadership. Uh, whatever the vision is for the patch, you can reach it consistently. There's not a lot of infighting. There's not a lot of need to divide the community to secure power for yourself because there is no opportunity to secure power for yourself. There is no free power. Like there is no power out there floating unattached to something all of the power is very clearly and visibly uh, kind of centered exactly where it's supposed to be. Also, there's a high degree of accountability, right? Because the, the power is formal. We know exactly who's in charge. We know exactly uh, who to blame if things go wrong or who to praise if things go right. And the corporate board can remove the CEO if mistakes are being made. People can exit if they don't uh, like what's going on. And so there is a there's a high probability of kind of very clear and formal accountability being laid kind of at the feet of these people. And then obviously you also have uh, what if you're going kind of along with mold bugs thesis that this creates a high degree of competitive uh, competitiveness. Uh, you have this situation where uh, you're seeing a lot of uh, motivation to create the best patch uh, to to be the the best corporation nation state because the competition is so high, which increases the uh, kind of quality of life of everyone, because there's there's no way to kind of escape the fact that if you run a bad patch, um, people are going to leave, you're going to get replaced. Uh, the, you always have an incentive to kind of be on top of your game. Are there any kind of other obvious uh, upsides that you might see that I didn't mention there to kind of uh, the, the possible patchwork idea? Well, I think that and alongside sort of bypassing democracy, uh, Yarvin also makes it kind of clear when talking about neocameralism and patchwork that you sort of just bypass a lot of the structural problems that sort of have existed with separation of powers. Because even inside our own government, right, we have these three branches, but even then um, we can sell that the idea of them being sort of co-equal um, has not really played out in the way that we've talked about. He expresses this as well when he sort of lambasts uh, James Madison and Federalist Number 10 about political factions, political parties, and one portion of the government ruling over the other. Um, you know, returning to these smaller and more confederated forms of these business sovereign entities would be a way to sort of bypass um, the one totalizing uh, confederation. Confederation 
centralizing form of government that overrules the rest. Um, you know, for him, it would be like if Otto von Bismarck had never unified all of the Germanic states and all the Germanic microstates existed as they were. You're not being under the rule of one sovereign authority. If you don't like the sovereign, say, outside of Hamburg, you know, you can go to Stuttgart or whatever and you'll be perfectly fine. And that's sort of an obvious way to bypass it, right? Like we have federalism on paper in the United States, but, you know, when the Supreme Court and the executive branch can take away rights that are enumerated in the Constitution to the states, what's kind of the point? And so Yarvin is sort of trying to see past some of the obvious uh, faults in our government that may not have been seen um, by the original founders in the 1780s. Sure. And so I, I think those are kind of good uh, first arguments, there, there are other advantages that could go, come, but some of them are kind of based on his assumptions, uh, you know, that, that go forward. Does everything actually play out the way that he wants? I mean, does the, this could have the advantage of world peace, right? Everybody just kind of, uh, you know, falls into this a multipolar stasis uh, where they, they're heavily disincentivized to really enter into any kind of military action. Uh, that's a possibility, but I think I think that's that's assuming a lot. So I guess uh, that said, we can dive into some of its weaknesses. Um, so I think the first weakness that many people might kind of think about is, uh, you know, how do we know that, uh, and you kind of brought this up before we started streaming, how do we know that the corporation stays a corporation? What, what's the incentive for this government to continue to act in this way? If there's a better form, a better way to kind of secure uh, it, it, you know, its sovereignty or to expand its power or its gains, those kind of things, its territorial monopoly, why would they can continue to abide by this particular structure? Yeah, and this is sort of the big thing that I was, uh, when I, looking back on sort of these UR posts and reading them before we went on the air and when we talked about doing the show, one of the things that sort of gets mentioned in, uh, in, in chapter one, as well as in the, the neo camera list bit is about um, how the subscriber or the person who uh, engages in these sort of states with soft corpse directors is that all these sort of cryptographic keys are meant to stop, um, you know, vertical integration or one state sort of buying out the other states because he doesn't like the idea of a permanent global Googocracy, right? Like, oh, we just sell everything to like the Google state. We're, we're good to go. Um, although I think BlackRock's doing a better job than Google is right now. Um, but, you know, that sort of form of stability is the, the thing I, I was concerned about because when you look at nation states as they exist today, um, you know, no nation state voluntarily gives up sovereignty in respects to its competitors unless it's by force or that he sees some sort of comparative advantage in reducing sovereignty for another benefit. I mean, you can see this with um, on paper, at least I don't think they're the world's best examples, but with like the European Union, sort of the Schengen agreement that, hey, there's going to be some rules made outside of Brussels. You're going to agree to this. And we're going to play along with these benefits. Um, nations naturally tend to pursue empire. I, that's something that I don't know would go away in this sort of uh, neo cameralist or patchwork state. If I have the means where my board or these anonymized figures recognize that our competition is killing us out there because they have access to a river or rare earth mineral resources on their territory, what's to stop them from going to war and seeking hegemony? Um, mm -hmm. So the idea of maintaining some kind of stable military peace, uh, I don't see likely. And when he talks about sort of Alongside cryptographic weapons, these other concepts of mutually assured destruction, you know, not every Singapore out there is going to have your, you know, McNukes, right? If we're going to play off the Hans Herma Hop a bit here. So to me, it's more of a concern of, well, how do you transition to this? Or even if it were to exist, how is it that, say, you know, the state operated enterprise of the People's Republic of China, because everything inside China is a state owned enterprise, doesn't just wallop you um, with that respect. So uh, the the international relations school of realism comes to mind as a rather large concern. And then the second one, and I think this is the more important one for what we've seen as sort of hindsight, is is that for Yarvin, this idea of neo this these patchwork states, is, is that they're kept in competition by profit motive and sort of business competition between these sovereign corporation entities where everything's ran like a joint stock company. Well, I think what we've definitely been able to notice, especially since 2008, 
is, is that a lot of corporations are willing to burn an ungodly amount of money uh, in order to achieve a message. I mean, Disney has burned millions of dollars in movies that are not um, particularly good. They're overly progressive. They don't, you know, give any respect to the source material. They are an insult to the cultures in which they came from. And consumers are obviously saying no to this. And that's a, and that's a form of voice alongside exit. So even though those companies can survive, you know, people protesting or one, you know, guy going into a grocery store and dumping Anne's Howard Bush beer into the, the middle of the aisle. So it raises the interesting question of, okay, well, you have exit and you have voice, but what is to stop a sovereign corporate entity from pursuing more totalitarian control through ideological means or administrative means like we've seen with our government or other quote-unquote woke corporations uh, from doing that instead of, you know, just relying on, on business. Yeah, I think that is um, a little naive of him to assume that, like, the soft power infiltration of this will kind of go away just because the democratic aspect is gone. Uh, I think that's kind of what he's banking on is that 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 need to kind of expand in that way disappears simply because democracy goes away, which I don't I don't think tracks as well. He has in some ways addressed bits of this problem with kind of what essentially becomes an additional layer of sovereignty on top of this. So in Gray Mirror, he kind of made these really vague posts about kind of how you need to control the air and you need to control the sea and you need to control space. And so, you know, if there was basically like this gigantic, like, you know, laser network of, of satellites that was kind of locked in by this, uh, again, like the, you know, cryptographic, you know, government, then uh, basically you, you could, you could basically have like another layer of sovereignty, like a, like a global sovereign that does nothing but say, this is how everybody has to play by the rules. And if you don't play by the rules, you're going to get hit by a space laser. And so like the idea is basically like you create this, this network here and it, it feels like we're just, you know, it feels like we're uh, creating God to another God to explain the existence of, of why God doesn't have to exist. You know what I mean? Like when atheists do this where they're like, okay, well, you know, this isn't real. We don't want to solve this problem. So there's another thing, you know, it's a, we're actually in a simulation. It's it's not God. It's a simulation. It feels like he's doing the same thing with government. It's it's not a, a, a real unified sovereign. It's, you know, it, it's another layer above that makes everybody play by the rules, but isn't the actual thing. And, and it feels a lot like that where, OK, well, we're going to get our we're going to get our tiny little patch states. But the only way we can keep them all in line is by creating a one world government that exists above the patch states and like enforces the continued, you know, compliance with kind of the corporate structure and and everybody playing by those rules. And so I, I'm not sure where he's going to take that next. If he's I, I asked him when he was on uh, the show uh, before kind of what happened to Patchwork, if we're going to see it again, because he's kind of walked away from this in a lot of ways, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. But uh, but he said it's going to come back. He said yeah, they're, they're still there. Um, but I think there's there's one more failing that I want to talk about before we talk about him walking away from it. And that is the exit focus, right? His focus here is exit. You know, no voice, all exit. You can't, you can't demand things from the government, but you can leave. And I think that's a huge problem because I think, like you said, what you want is loyalty, right? Like the, the, the third option here. And, and the problem is this is Yarvin is still stuck in this very modern idea of kind of completely der deracinated uh, cultures and peoples, right? Like, the, the, the community isn't what matters. The culture isn't what matters. You know, the church isn't what matters. The only thing that matters is kind of the efficiency of the machine. And so he's still stuck in this kind of managerial solution. He's not looking at spiritual uh, uh, solutions. He's not looking at communal solutions. He's not looking at uh, even martial solutions. The only solutions are merchant based. They're all technology, efficiency, uh, properly operating bureaucracies. Like this is this is what the solution is. And if you don't like it, we just move you to somewhere else where uh, where it's going to be better. But like people staying in one place is what builds culture. It's what builds community. It's what builds a, a spirit of people being able to work together and improve things. And he's he's just treating everybody as kind of this individual deracinated mercenary instead of understanding that like there's a huge human cost to having this 
interchangeable style of kind of uh, living, you know, like in America, it's always, Hey, you got to go move across the country to like, you know, leave your family and never have connections to anything you love and your culture and everything in order to make an opportunity. It's like, actually, you know, that, that destroys communities that destroys organic organization that destroys all of this stuff. And so I think in, uh, in a kind of a weird way, he is ignoring the core of the problem to kind of continue down the more modernist understanding of like what a human being is and how to solve that issue. Yeah. The other thing of course re re resumes back the question over tyranny. Like if we're going to have sort of a CEO, le Leviathan, um, the question really doesn't then become, so what do you do to remove him? Like he's talked about this before that there's a board of directors that keeps him holding accountable, but if they're all residents of this sort of sovereign corporation, it's patchwork realm, I mean, in his own words, he says residents of a patchwork realm have no security or privacy against the realm. There is no possible conflict in the matter not being malignant. The government is not a threat to its residents. And since it is sovereign, they are not a threat to it, the absence of conflict. And then he says that they all are, there are even temporary visitors to the realm carry an ID card with an RFID response. Everyone's genotyped, iris scan, uh, public transportation. You know, we're, we're going to turn everything into London with its CCTV and sort of NSA levels of being able to spy and or surveil everyone. So even if something were to go wrong, then there's still an opportunity for literal control and command to stay over in the state, which again, if you don't want any voice, you don't want any participation, they can leave. Well, what's to stop you from uh, bypassing, say, profit motive and say, you know, having these people enslaved? His answer, of course, is to say, well, that's not profitable and people would probably not want to be there anyways. But again, the, to me, if you have everything controlled, surveilled, people can just get up and leave. There's no culture that can be formulated. There's no reason for me to stay. There's no semblance of loyalty. Uh, I don't have a loyalty to... Um, well, I don't have a loyalty to my president right now, that's for sure. But I don't have like loyalty, for instance, if Elon Musk were to start Patchwork X out, you know, outside of like Austin, Texas. Yeah. Like, and I, you know, I don't see myself being loyal to that, being like, yep, I'm willing to die for Elon Musk. I'm willing to die for random soft corp, you know, joint stock company CEO King. Um, there isn't a, and it goes back to the sort of the issue about like faith or materialism and religion is, is that there isn't this sort of unifying aspect of what brings people together. People don't believe in anything and they're sort of this deracinated, deculturated, deterritorialized people. What's the point? Because sure, you know, Yarvin can square the peg into the round hole when it comes to being an atheist that believes in the divine right of kings. But the average person that you're going to rule over needs something to believe in or those that are your rivals who have a better political formula or better yet a belief system, uh, I see being more of a prominent threat here. Um, and I mean, even then, right? Like we can look at really t poorly run places in the world like South Africa. South Africa since 1994 has slowly degraded into rolling blackouts and poor quality of life, lengthy times for government services. The roads are ran poorly. But the white South Africans that are in there who are targeted for racial crime, violence, murder, etc., they still stay there because that's where they exist. That is their homeland. That is their culture. And it's been that way long, you know, with the Huguenots and the explorers that have been there. That's the only place on earth where Afrikaner is spoken. Why would they leave? And that becomes the same question about, um, you know, trying to set up these sort of federal or, you know, sovereign entities is, well, what would be the point in staying if I have no culture? We see this all the time in America where, you know, mom and dad live in the middle of nowhere, their kid goes off to California, and they no longer have any relationship because they've been totally changed by California culture, and then they have awkward fights over the dinner table at Christmas and Thanksgiving, and a family is broken. So it really does illustrate, I think, some of the cultural bonds and weaknesses of this project that I think comes with most, if not all, materialist lenses of looking at politics because you do need something deeper to anchor you to it. Yeah. It, it, I always have been kind of caught uh, by that uh, Carl Schmidt passage about the, the monstrous nature of asking a man to die for an economic zone. And that's kind of, yeah. that, that's kind of exactly what you'd be doing here, you know, and, and it's, it is very difficult, you know, it, it's kind of assuming that, well, because of this competition, there'll always be good times and the, you know, uh, everything will always kind of get solved through this, but th that's just not how 
real life works and in those moments of difficulty what brings people together what binds them together for the good instead of just having them all immediately you know jump out the escape hatch uh you know all heroic moments are really or i shouldn't say all heroic moments but most many heroic moments are those where people denied exit you know where they where they you know they stood firm and you know the the human spirit overcomes or are often moments where people turn away from that option. And so I, I think there's a, a real bit of that missing there, like you said, because of kind of the materials nature of this. All right. So as we've said, Yarvin doesn't talk a lot about this anymore, though. It sounds like he might still be, you know, turning it over in his mind. He might still be thinking about how to retool this. Uh, one person who's really sad about, you know, Yarvin not continuing to pursue this is Nick Land. Nick Land is obviously a Another neo reactionary philosopher, somebody who's intimately tied to Yarvin's work, uh, who's uh, you know stuff I've, you and I have done episodes on, and I've done with with other people, kind of explaining much of his work. What's what's Nick Land's problem with Yarvin kind of abandoning this? If it's so obviously flawed, why why does he see this as an issue? So uh, Nick Land, of course, I, I know that Curtis doesn't read a lot of criticisms or responses to his work. I, I don't know if he's read anything of Nick Land since the last time he said he hasn't read anything of him. But in The Dark Enlightenment, uh, Nick Land talks about exit sort of being this core fundamental trait of sort of the Anglo-American identity. I mean, you saw this when sort of these Puritans and Anabaptists and Quakers all decided to, to leave and go, you know, across the sea and sort of for this desire of religious exit. Uh, they're not Anglicans. They're not Catholics. So we might as well just go somewhere else. Uh, you saw this, of course, with the concept of the Hartford Convention um, in the 1800s or later yet when the South actually did secede from the Union. Um, and we see this, of course, with things like white flight, right? People naturally want to avoid bad areas and want to start fresh elsewhere. We see this even to this day when blue state, you know, people leave for Texas or Florida. We saw this during COVID. We still see this today with progressive policy. Um, and so he notices that exit is sort of this really key aspect of how um, Americans especially try to resolve their problems. And uh, by sort of abandoning this concept or abandoning this project, you're sort of ignoring this key um, I don't want to say like it's a purely identitarian issue, but you're, you're abandoning something that is a, an important variable to consider when looking at politics um, on the right today. And then the other reason why is, is because exit is a key form of accelerationism. If I can get up and leave en masse, I'm accelerating the collapse of a state per the Hirschauer concept of exit and voice being these ways to gauge the decline and quality of a government or an organization. So uh, clearly, as rich people fled during COVID out of New York or California, you know, those states had significant tax revenue problems to a point where, you know, governors in New Jersey and New York were like trying to find ways to incentivize the wealthy to come back to, to New York City because so much of their, of their government budgets were ran off of these revenues and taxes off the wealthy um by so by trying to get not focus on this issue or not talk about it as much um you know land kind of used this as a method where well these are important things to look at on how we can either accelerate and get to this sort of like weird techno capitalist utopia or um you know sort of bring about the collapse of really crappy leftist governments right absolutely yeah so he sees this and you know he talks about this a number of times in the dark enlightenment about kind of just the, the, the need to flee, right? Like fleeing the zombie apocalypse is the only option. There's no negotiation with it. And so he's kind of sees this as kind of the last refuge of, of escaping the, the democratic virus of, of kind of escaping uh, what is kind of consuming much of the Western world. And so, uh, you know, stepping away from this project is, is a bit of a problem for him, but I do think uh, there, there is just an acknowledgement, you know, that, there is, I think, at the heart of this, the the want to avoid conflict, right? The the desire to create a situation in which no existential questions ever really have to be answered, because there's always another way out. There's always another place to flee. There's always another where place to go. Uh, you know, there, there's there's this never has to come to a head. And this, of course, again puts me to the mind of Carl Schmidt and and kind of the idea of liberalism being the escape from kind of the clash of existential questions and identities, right? Like we, if we can just engineer the world correctly, if we can just engineer states correctly, 
then we never have to come to kind of the, those hard questions and, and the attempts to resolve them. Uh, we can always just find a new and different way to kind of bail ourselves out, find some kind of neutral management position, find some way to kind of uh, to push that friend enemy distinction into the corner. Uh, but again, I think you eventually run into the same problem, which is these are eternal aspects of the human condition and they will reemerge and perhaps in any more, even more horrific ways if you deny their existence. Yeah, I mean, to me, it just feels like it is the Silicon Valley's attempt at some kind of secular millionism, right? That we can build some kind of way to bypass the issues of man and what, uh, and, and of course, the bypass sort of the, the Christian ideas of like sin or that we are just naturally fallen beings and things like this. I mean, he mentions this with, with Patriarcha, where it's just like Robert Filmer gives you a, a Calvinist answer for why crap just happens and you have to accept it. Um, whereas, you know, he's trying to build a way where, well, when crap happens, you can just get up and go. And it, I think it still runs into the hard economic concerns of, well, business entities that are purely focused on profit motive as a way to compete with others. Like, do would they have an answer on how to keep people from being there or from just getting up and leaving when a recession happens? Um, you know, if we're still operating on this sort of boom and bust cycle of business, uh, are we going to be able to maintain uh, our sovereignty of a particular territory or corporate entity um, when the bad times happen or say there's a run on a bank or something like that? These things are not uh, fleshed out fully. And I do hope that he returns back to the idea, uh, maybe to perhaps answer some of these questions. But to me, it does seem like you run into uh, the limits that we fundamentally cannot have infinite growth from a finite number of resources. Um, are these going to be, you know, are, are, are these little micro states like, you know, Singapore, are we going to run into the problem of Spantrals, the IQ shredder? Are we going to just yeah. have low birth rates everywhere that you go? And eventually we're going to see a real demographic problem. Uh, and this compounds the problem of the competency crisis, as Palladium magazine was just writing about not too long ago, that, you know, are, is, is FedCorp going to have an HR uh, resource department where, you know, we're going to ensure that there's diversity, equity, and inclusion. And are we going to make sure that the trains run on time or the airplanes don't fly out of the sky? Uh, these are things that are sort of taken for granted. And again, it's while this is all theoretical, it's all very new. He, you know, this has never been tried before. These are real concerns for when you're trying to propose an alternative when you're talking about things like peaceful regime change or an alternative to the current mechanisms of government that we have, which are clearly not working you would want to offer something that's better than, hey, imagine strip mall, but a country, you know, you, you want something yeah. that offers more incentive than that. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we've covered this in pretty good detail, guys. Like I said, it's it's an idea that in many ways has kind of been passed by as people have kind of seen the numbers, number of problems with it. But it does, you know, for many people who have asked, is there any solution offered by these people? It, you know, this is one of them. And I think it does, if nothing else, create a, a really interesting thought experiment. One of the things I like about Yarvin as a thinker is even when he's wrong, he's wrong in interesting ways. And so by exploring things that even, you know, where we think, oh, that doesn't work or that's going to fall apart, those kind of things, we can still find important truths, important, uh, you know, realizations, important things that we need to incorporate when we're thinking about this stuff. And I wanted to make sure that we cover this because this is a core idea of kind of part of neo-reactionary philosophy. And I know many people have not you know, read all of this stuff. They're not familiar with all this stuff. They haven't gone back and kind of done all the legwork on this. So it's nice to have kind of some of these explainer videos and these streams that kind of pull these concepts together and allow you to explore them before maybe you go reading them on your own. I know that I did a lot of that. Guys like Charlemagne, uh, guys like Clausington uh, and Amnesis, they were creating you know, videos that I watched before I read mold bug so when i did I, I kind of understood better what i was reading i find those very important and, and, and helpful and i think uh that's that's one of the reasons i try to make them for people as well all right prudentials we're going to swing over to the questions of the people but before we do where do people find your excellent work oh sure well once again thank you for having me on orn you can find me at findmyfriends.net slash prudentialist i mainly cover history culture and international relations and uh, you can find me on YouTube, Twitter, Telegram, and all of those wonderful links that you can find down below at the description. And that's what I am. And that's what I do. Excellent. All right, guys, let's go over here to our questions real quick. We only have a couple. 
Uh, JS here. Thank you very much, sir. Can Mecha Bentham be the monarch, please? If you uh, manage to assemble uh, Mecha Bentham, let me know. He does have to fight Mecha Godzilla. Those are just the rules. Uh, but should he, uh, you know, win the challenge, the trial by combat, then obviously he would ascend to the throne. Uh, again, you know, I, I don't make the rules. These, these is just uh, this is just the way that uh, we assemble patchwork. All I right. think they preserved his head. So, I mean, you, it's, <laughs> we're, we're, you're one step closer to the, the Jeremy Bentham sort of head in a jar like Richard Nixon. And, and I was going to uh, say, we can, yeah, we can get uh, <laughs> you can get the, the uh, future Rama Nixon bringing back, you know, I, again, Absolutely. I do require the, the, the battle to the death, though. It's, uh, there, there's other yes, mechas, too, yes. right? There's like Mecha Godzilla and there's another Mecha I'm trying to think of all the Kaiju. Mecha. Anyway, uh, but yeah, no, we, we definitely want to see that showdown. Uh, Pernobian Chomsky for nine ninety nine. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, read Prude's piece on Kukagard. Absolutely, everyone should check out the Prudentialist's Substack. He just had an excellent piece. Piece was very interesting. Oren, have you considered doing some streams on Kukagard? His writing is dense but edifying. So I am. I have a, what I'd, I'd call like a survey level knowledge of Kukagard. I read him in college. And I have read him in bits and pieces throughout my life, but I have never really drilled down on Kukagard. And so I, I would say at this point, while I, I do find his thought interesting, I am not uh, well read on it. Some of the things you'll run into, guys, like one of the things you'll notice is like I keep being in this scenario where I need to read more. But every time I need to read more, I also realize that what I should really be doing is rereading everything I've already read. Because there's so much there. Guys like Spangler, uh, guys like uh, uh, Thomas Carlyle. Like these are people, you know, whose books I need to read many, many times to, to get them. I don't just read complicated books once. And so like I know, for instance, like I need to read Heidegger. But Heidegger is such a commitment to grasp properly. I know I'm going to need to read it like three times. And I still need to go back and read Oswald Spangler another time, you know, to like to bring all that stuff forward. So like I want to understand more of Kukagard's thought, but uh, I don't know. Uh, Prudential, since you just did a video, I, I don't know how deeply read you are in Kukagard, but where should people start? Well, I would recommend, of course, the uh, the two ages of literary review. That's the the work that I was building off of to write that recent essay called Kierkegaard in the Gay Paperclip. Kind of takes a, a look at the, the concept of the leveling, which I recommend that people look into. Um, the Attack Upon Christendom is also a really good piece to consider. Now, this is 19th century work. This is stuff to sort of look at when people are looking at the um, Reformation and Christianity falling now in the wake of this sort of Enlightenment pure reason uh, skepticism. He's very critical of people like Edmund Burke or Alexis de Tocqueville in comparison. Um, I think that if you want an interesting counterbalance to the existential crises of Europe in the 19th century, um, I think that you should read Nietzsche alongside Kierkegaard and Dostoyevsky. But I would definitely say uh, the two ages, a literary review and attack upon Christendom are great places to start if you want to get into Kierkegaard. Excellent. So there you go. I don't know if we'll be doing a stream anytime soon, but if I uh, if I do, I know who to go to for uh, uh, for that. All right. So uh, Donnie DeWitt for 999. Uh, would y'all agree to a concept of exit that allowed uh, extreme freedom of association and exit as long as every entity agreed on core principles such as Christ? Uh, so I'm not uh, I guess I'll take that in pieces. So the the. Uh, you know, both Hoppe and I believe Moldbug are obviously pretty, pretty strong on freedom of association. That's one of the more controversial parts about Hoppe, of course, especially in the libertarian community. But he's very clear that like that is a key part of this, that people can assemble the communities as they would like under these contracts. And that is uh, including, you know, exclusionary, uh, you know, devices of all kinds. Uh, and so I think that that's a, a pretty strong uh portion of kind of patchwork and uh both patchwork and kind of the uh contractual communities of hapa uh of the kind of uh as long as everyone entity agreed on core principles such as christ i mean you know christ is king so i think everybody should agree with those principles in general but i'm not sure what that has to do with this in particular i'm not sure how that that general unity i mean both of these people, I think, due to their kind of freedom of association, would say if communities want to not agree to those principles, 
that would be part of their freedom of association. If you wanted to form an Islamic or an atheist or whatever community, you would kind of have that. But I don't know, Prudentialist, how, how do you see that question? Do you have anything to add there? I mean, I'm an incredibly big pro freedom of association guy. Wish it existed in my country. Wish it was back in some former context. Uh, you know, if everyone agreed to it, I mean, in some form of covenant, sort of like what Yarvin describes, where it's based upon uh, you know, total allegiance or total belief and faith in Christ. I mean, this would be, I guess, in, in a world where like, you know, there was sort of this patchwork world, but um, it was the various churches or denominations like, yeah, you'd find me over at the, uh, the Orthodox sort of patchwork church state, wherever that might exist. But uh, I mean, on, on paper, that sounds like a lovely idea, but I think that that also would be a fun thought experiment on how you you mix that with uh, the various Christian denominations and churches and their views on political theology and how they should govern in the world. But uh, I mean, I would definitely be in support of something like that. I mean, I. All right. So I think I might have lost credentials there for a second. Hopefully he'll jump back in. Uh, but Thuggo here for five dollars. In some Native American communities, banishment was the ultimate punishment. Is this a similar concept? Well, actually, uh, that was the pu ultimate punishment in many uh, ancient communities, not just Native American communities. Of course, uh, banishment was a very serious penalty in places like, uh, you know, uh, the Italian city states or the uh, the Greek city states. Uh, the big thing about this, of course, was that banishment, you know, um, the, the, the city state was kind of the natural, uh, size that most, uh, civilizations could kind of grow to at that point. And so banishment from your city state was very serious because, uh, people tended to take kind of their ethnos far more seriously. In many ways, they would often tie it kind of directly to their national identity that, that those were the same thing. And so uh, being banished from those kind of completely cut you off from any possibility of political tie, any possibility of social tie. If you were banished, uh, you were banished from your hometown and you couldn't just easily immigrate into another city state because that city state defined kind of its existence by its ethnos. And because you were not part of that, you joining, maybe, maybe you might get the opportunity to live in that city, but you would never be a part of it in the way that like, People are a part of, say, America now in many ways. People think of that where you just kind of get a piece of paper and you're a citizen. That was not a thing in most ancient communities. And so banishment was very serious because it wasn't just, oh, you can't live here anymore. It's that you'll never be like a native part of any culture again, because that, that's not kind of they didn't have this liberal idea of kind of just moving in between that kind of your your national allegiance, your cultural allegiance would just be kind of mercenary and you could move between it. So in some ways, yeah, I mean, this does bring that back because if you are banished from your patch, it is, you know, then you are forced to move to a worse patch, right? So if you are not abiding by kind of that community, uh, then you would have to move to another community that is not as ideal and it would by definition be worse. And that community might not want you. They might ask for your references, you know, like, like a business. Hey, if your last job fired you, why should we let you in, right? Uh, same thing. If your last patch threw you out, why should we let you in? However, it does lose some of that identity kind of uh, kind of aspect of punishment, right? Of banishment. Because banishment was kind of primarily a, a, uh, a punishment because it was a loss of identity and community. And because these patches are entirely mercenary, they wouldn't have the same idea of identity and community. And so therefore, you know, you, you wouldn't quite have the same. It would be still be a punishment, but it would be a punishment that is of a slightly different kind. It would be more materialistic and less kind of spiritual and cultural, uh, which, again, as we've noted, is is something that is a recurring theme throughout many of uh, Yarvin's kind of uh, assessments, assumptions and solutions. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. It looks like we did lose the Prudentialist here, but of course, uh, he is great. You should check out all of his work. Hopefully, you know his internet will will return to him soon. Uh, but I really appreciate him coming by. Make sure that you check out everything that he's doing. And also, of course, if it's your first time here, please make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel. If you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to 
the Oren McIntyre show on your favorite podcast platform. When you do that, please make sure that you leave a reading or review that really helps a rating or review that really helps with all of that algorithm magic. All right, guys, thank you once again so much for coming by. And as always, I'll talk to you next time.